it's April 20th, 420. And some of you probably are watching this at 420 a.m. For some of you, that may mean something. But there are a lot of you probably saying, so what? And the truth be told, most of us around here didn't know what 420 signified until we saw it this week on a primetime show on another network, and it wasn't even an Aaron Sorkin show. If you know what 420 is, you're laughing right now. So we invited someone in to explain. He is Stephen Hager, the editor-in-chief of High Times Magazine. I was born and grew up in a small town in Illinois, a university town called Champaign-Urbana. At that time, I was being raised in the Lutheran faith and was going to Saturday school and Sunday school. And uh, I got to talk to the pastor one day and I asked him what was going to happen to all the Jews and the Buddhists and the people in Africa. And he told me they were all going to hell. And I went home and I told my parents I wouldn't go back to that church anymore because in my heart I could not believe what that guy was saying. <laughs> entered Urbana High School in 1966 at the age of 15. After I um, kind of lost faith in Christianity, I was looking for something and I was reading all these books, books by Jack Kerouac and Ken Kesey, and I think the most important book was probably Tom Wolfe's account of Ken Kesey uh, and the Merry Pranksters. I ended up going to San Francisco, and, and LSD was unheard of in Champaign-Urbana. So me and my friends, we became the first people in our high school to actually take LSD and smoke marijuana. Created my own underground newspaper called the Tin Whistle, which just got bigger and bigger every month till it was being distributed in four high schools in my area, and it was banned in every single one of them. The only thing that was really uh, of really importance to me at that time uh, was rock and roll, and there was a local band that had appeared that year in 1966 called the Finchley Boys, and they were sort of like the the Beatles of, of my hometown. The schools were getting really polarized at the time between the long hairs who were merging and the jocks and the greasers and the black students who were followers of Malcolm X. And we printed a letter from an anonymous student complaining about racism inside the athletic department. And that letter set off a firestorm. The athletic director and football coach, Smitty, called a meeting of all the lettermen in school and told them he wasn't a racist. In fact, he put more niggers through college than any other coach in the state. Jim Wilson, who was the starting tight end, as well as the place kicker, was an old friend of mine. So he got blamed for writing that letter, even though he was not the author of the letter. And it ended his football career. When uh, this student council elections took place, there were three major candidates. One was my best friend Larry Green, who was the long hair candidate. The other was Jim Wilson, who was the black candidate. And the last was some guy who was just representing the, the preppy kids in the school. And when Larry Green got up to make his announcement, he ended up just reading a beatnik poem by Shel Silverstein. And then he threw his votes to Jim Wilson. It ended up Jim got elected and he was the first black ever elected to the student council. Jim organized a race awareness event. Every student in the school filled out a survey on racial attitudes and then some of the comments were read out loud in front of the entire student body. The event revealed that racism was rampant. I became an event promoter and started creating rock shows in order to help raise money to pay the publishing costs for the Tin Whistle. Much to my surprise, I soon found myself the target of a state narcotics investigation. And they uh, produced some wild trumped up charge against me. I responded by running an interview with the informant who had set me up on the charges. 
Good morning, Stephen. Hi. Good morning. So on Boston Public, on this television show, there was this big controversy about the 420 Club and the kids being involved in 420. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know what the number 420 meant, but apparently it's got some signification with marijuana use, right? Yeah, it's, it's been a code word for many years in, inside the uh, counterculture. To, to, it's as a code for marijuana. Now, what is it? Where did it come from? It actually came from in 1971. Uh, six uh, students at San Rafael High School invented it. And it just sort of spread through the Grateful Dead underground for many years. And then High Times discovered it. And once we started publicizing it, it really went global. So, what's so special about the numbers 420? Well, they picked 420 because it was the time of day they were going to meet to go look for an abandoned pot patch that they found a treasure map to. I was working as a reporter for the New York Daily News and covering the art scene for a variety of publications when I discovered hip hop. I was at an exhibit titled New York New Wave when I saw a photograph of a subway car titled Break by Futura 2000. At the time, Curtis Blow's rap song, The Breaks, was climbing the charts. Futura's train tied all the elements together and set me off on a two-year project. Fat Five Freddy introduced me to Africa Mambata, who granted extensive interviews and connected me with Cool Herc. In 1988, I became the editor of High Times Magazine connected me up with my counterculture roots and I was inspired by the saga of Tom Frassad. I created a hemp activist group called the Freedom Fighters that set up free campgrounds and gave free food to activists. Our peak moment always came when we'd parade into a rally in full dress costume with drums beating and flags unfurled. The Freedom Fighters created the Boston Freedom Rally, which quickly became the largest political event in the country. We successfully recaptured the flag from the American right wing and took back the soul and spirit of the Founding Fathers. We were messing with their symbols. Red snapper in the Cincy butter Makes a young girl's heart go a flutter The energy spark plug for the Freedom Fighters as well as the featured speaker in most of the rallies was Chef Ra who was actually Jim Wilson who had reincarnated himself as a Rastafarian. Unfortunately the Freedom Fighters became the subject of an intensive Secret Service investigation the West Virginia leader, Roger Belknap, was railroaded into jail while some other state leaders had their homes broken into and their membership information removed. Things got so hot that I gave the membership lists of several thousand names to normal and stopped organizing political rallies. Instead, I wanted to concentrate on ceremonial events that would document the use of cannabis as a spiritual tool you know, we spent the last 10 years trying to get sick people access to marijuana, and that's been very successful. It's interesting that this is around Earth Day as well, and another issue, obviously, for people who are interested in cannabis is hemp. Right. And if you can explain to people why hemp and Earth Day would tie into each other. Well, the, the, the part that's used for medicine is the flower, mm -hmm. and the rest of it, the stalk, is, can be used for about 40,000 different items, and everything that it used to be made out of is now made out of petrochemicals, which is, petrochemicals are the major cause of pollution on the planet. Mm -hmm. So we'd really like to see farmers growing non-THC mm -hmm. industrial hemp as a commodity for, to replace all these petrochemical products. I was in junior high school when President Kennedy was assassinated and I had a hard time swallowing the uh, Warren Commission report when it came out. By the time I was in high school I was convinced that the CIA was actually behind the assassination 
and there'd been an enormous cover-up to hide this. After um, I started publishing Jack Herrera's Hemp Conspiracy, the next big conspiracy I turned to was trying to unveil the Kennedy assassination. I wrote an article uh, for the 25th anniversary of the assassination that Judge Jim Garrison called the best article ever written about the assassination. And I really just concentrated on the rabbit holes and disinfo campaigns that had been perpetrated by the national media to confuse people about what had really happened. I think that what this shows is that uh, the counterculture, which was sort of a spiritual revolution that took place in the 60s, is really kind of like an infant baby spirituality that's birthing. And what you see here is the first real national holiday of this culture is emerging. And what's kind of interesting is that it's, uh, it's around the same time as all these other big holidays like Passover and Easter. And, uh, and it's universally and globally adopted by millions of people now as a holiday. After I got hired by High Times, the first big story I did was to go to Amsterdam to interview the founder of the Seed Bank, a man named Neville who had created a multi-million dollar operation by shipping high-quality cannabis seeds around the world. While I was out there working on the story, I ran into some Americans who told me about the harvest festivals that had taken place in Northern California in the 70s. And it gave me the idea of trying to have a similar harvest festival legally in Amsterdam so we could establish a worldwide standard for cannabis. I called the event the Cannabis Cup. Several years later, Ken Babs of the Merry Pranksters passed through New York. We got a chance to meet. Inspired by the art of the Merry Pranksters, the spirituality of Stephen and Nina May Gaskin, and the practicality of the Rainbow Gatherings, I created some unique spiritual events called We. And the primary focus was a Sunday sunset silent meditation in Ohm. Well, I think the problem is the way you're defining the whole debate to lump every um, substance together and call that drugs, but then leave off legal drugs and pretend that that's not part of the debate is, is part of the whole problem. Oh, the I don't, I mean, in all fairness, this. I now, don't think Now, the two anybody most dangerous drugs in America are alcohol and tobacco. They kill 500,000 people a year. Now, if 1,000 people die a year from heroin, isn't it a bigger problem that 500,000 are dying of alcohol and tobacco? And when you talk about glamorization, every major sporting event shows beer commercials that are ob obviously targeting young minds to a lifelong addiction of alcohol. So isn't that considered the glamorization of drugs as well? There were a lot of landowners and festival uh, promoters who contacted me because they knew what I was trying to do with the ceremonies and they wanted me to come uh, do ceremonies on their property with them. Most of these people now are in jail or uh, they're dead. Roger Belknap and Gideon Israel were just two examples of the freedom fighters who tried to establish events and found themselves uh, put in jail and with their assets seized. But uh, the absolute worst tragedy occurred when Tom and Raleigh of Rainbow Farm tried to make a last stand on their property. All right, thank you. That's a little bit of hippie magic. The site that they've been using for the festivals, the house they lived in, everything they owned was going to be seized by the government. So they decided rather than let the government take it, they were going to burn it all and that they were actually going to prevent the seizure by forcibly trying to retain their property. They were shot dead by FBI snipers. So you don't see 420 as part of the drug culture, you see it as part of a different kind of culture? I see it as part of an emerging spirituality that I call the counterculture. Now why would something that is a counterculture, something like 420, you said at the beginning, mm -hmm. to keep the authorities out, or parents right. or cops, why go public with it? There are going to be celebrations in different parts of the country and different sort of rallies. Well, now everybody knows about it, the people yeah. that... Uh, but you know, when the, the Christians were first persecuted in Rome, they developed a secret code, the symbol of a fish. 
And when, when they would meet and they didn't know if they were Christians or not, one would draw half the fish, the other would finish the fish. Well, we've been doing 420 for a long time now, since the 70s. And it's time to bring it out into the open. It's time to show the, the world that we're a legitimate minority group that suffers persecution. What's going to happen on 420? And besides people getting stoned, what's going to happen? Well, I think that the most traditional and the biggest, one of the biggest celebrations will probably be on the top of Mount Tamalpais, which is the central peak of Marin County. That's the birthplace of 420, and that's where the tradition I has been established for the longest. What I'd like to see happen, I'd like to see a moment of silence for peace in the drug war. I'd like to see a moment of silence for the victims of Waco and Columbine and Oklahoma City. And I know there's a lot of, you know, very tragic events that are happening right around the same time. And I, and I think that we need to, to study why these things are happening. Why is there so much violence in our culture? And really what the 60s counterculture represents is nonviolence and peace. And this is what we're trying to bring to the table. You can investigate who's behind 911 and the global system of banking and military that manufactures war for profit. But don't forget, the culture you create is much more important. Don't think culture is something you buy in a box or watch on television. It's actually the ceremonies that you and your tribe create. Jump out of the box and start creating your own culture.